Hi guys. It is a pleasant but hazy, maybe smoky day. I'm not sure. Sunday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization and I need to get out and spread a truckload of manure on my big organic garden here at Bugs in a Jar Farm to get ready to plant my red clover for the winter time here. And, uh, oh yes, my name is Sam Mitchell. This is Collapse Chronicles. This is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza, doing what we do every day, and that is chronicling all sorts of collapses. And uh, it is Sunday, September 27th, 2020, and uh, I'm sorry I cannot remember the name of the alert listener who sent me the link to Gail Tverberg's uh, latest essay, Our Finite World, I believe, is Gail's uh, website. I have a couple of, I think I've interviewed Gail twice on Collapse Chronicles in the past year. You can find my interviews with her, but it's always good to check in with Gail every uh every couple of months to see what's on her mind and this is a long involved uh, piece. I'm going to put the link on here and you can go read it yourself so uh, but I'm just going to skip ahead to about halfway through and pick up with the second half where Gail uh, asking the question and hopefully answering the question <clears throat> What happens when an economy outgrows its resources? Most people think that the issue we are dealing with is a temporary problem associated with a new coronavirus. I think that we are dealing with a much worse problem, which is another way of saying that the corona panic is a... Anyway, Gail thinks that we are dealing with a much worse problem than the corona panic. The world's population has outgrown the world's resource limits. Ha! Huh. Imagine that. Thank you, Gail, for pointing out the bigger problem than the C word. <clears throat> this, this, the fact that our world's population has outgrown our world's resource limits. This is part of the reason many people feel that shutting down the economy for, you know, to fight the corona panic is a good choice. There are really many reasons for the shutdowns besides preventing the spread of the virus. Keeping people inside stops the many protests related to low wages and, and everything else and climate protest and protest against uh, anyway, I'm going to, this is her rant, not mine. Anyway, the shutdowns appear to restore order to a troubled system. Broken supply lines from shutdowns elsewhere reduce raw materials availability, making it more difficult to keep production in one part of the world operating when others are closed. Overshoot and collapse. Overshoot and collapse is a problem that many smaller economies have encountered over the years. If I am right that we are now encountering a similar situation, there is a big change ahead. The change will not be instantaneous, however. The big question that arises is over what time scale does such a collapse take place? If it takes place over a number of years, 
it may look more like overshoot and decline than overshoot and collapse to those who are living through the era. A, re a recent partial collapse was that of the Soviet Union in 1991. The Soviet Union was an oil exporter. Oil prices had hit a high in 1981 and had been declining for 10 years when the Soviet Union collapsed. With low oil prices, it had been difficult to earn enough revenue to reinvest in new oil, field, oil fields to replace the production that naturally declines as oil is extracted. Oil, directly and indirectly, had provided many jobs for the Soviet Union. After 10 years of stress, the central government of the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Low oil prices first slowed production growth between 1982 and 1987, and she has all of her little charts and graphs and everything here. Oil production began to decline in 1998, three years before the government collapsed. Production gradually rose again in the early 2000s as oil prices rose again. What was surprising to me was the fact that consumption of all types of energy by the Soviet Union fell at the time of the central government collapse in 1991, even hydroelectric. The overall level of energy consumption never bounced back to its previous level. What happened was that many inefficient industries were forced to close. Some of these industries were in the Ukraine, others were in Russia and elsewhere. As they closed, less electricity and less oil and gas were used. The loss in energy consumption was pretty much permanent. The manufacturing that left the Soviet Union was replaced by other, more efficient manufacturing elsewhere. Also, without their previous manufacturing jobs, the people of the former Soviet Union were poorer. <coughs> they could not afford to buy cars and homes, keeping fuel consumption lower. Another indicator regarding the speed of collapse is the analysis done by researchers Peter Turchin and Sergei Nefedov regarding collapse of eight agricultural economies from earlier periods. I compile the information they provided in the book Secular Cycles in the chart shown in figure four, and the cycles they analyze, the crisis period, seem to last 20 to 50 years. One thing that is striking in their analysis is that epidemics often played a major role in the declines. As wage disparity grew, poorer workers are less well they became more vulnerable to epidemics and often died. In these early cycles, the major industry was farming. These collapses were in the days before electricity use. In these situations, collapse tended to play out over 20 to 50 years. Our more modern economy, with its just-in-time supply lines, would seem likely to collapse more quickly, but we can't know for certain. This analysis is thus another data point that suggests that what may be ahead could be closer to overshoot and decline than overshoot and collapse which brings her into the next part uh, of her essay. And remember, I, I started this 
halfway through it. So now, this is what Dale Tverberg says what may be ahead, which of course is what this uh, channel is all about. In case you guys have not figured out what this channel is all about, it is a survey of all of these uh, different people who spend their lives analyzing this issue. Uh, and this is Dale, Gail Tverberg, uh, her latest uh, glimpse into the tea leaves. Okay, what may be ahead? <clears throat> okay, first, we are likely to experience the collapse of central governments of several of the oil exporting nations in a manner not entirely different from the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Oil prices have been low for a very long time, since 2008 or at least since 2014. Most OPEC oil producers seem to require prices in the $100 per barrel range in order to be able to fund the programs their people expect. One important program provides subsidies for imported food, while other programs provide jobs. Without these programs, revolutions to overthrow the current leaders seem much more likely. At this point, oil prices have been below $100 per barrel since 2014, a period of six years. Stress is increasing. OPEC producers have cut production in an attempt to try to get prices up. That prices are now in the low 40s. We should not be surprised if over the next few years, oil production starts to fall in several areas around the world because of the internal problems can you say Venezuela? Another possible impetus for the drop in production may be wars with other nations. Some such wars might be started simply to try to get the price of oil up to a more acceptable level. <clears throat> we have been falsely led to believe that oil is not important. <clears throat> Renewables can handle our needs in the future. <clears throat> in fact, oil is essential for today's farming. It is essential for transportation of goods and services of all kinds. It is essential for the construction industry and for mining. <clears throat> Researchers in academic institutions have received grants encouraging them to put together models regarding what could be ahead. These models, you know, talking about how renewable energy is going to replace fossil fuels, tend to be extremely unrealistic. One of the most absurd models is by Mark Jacobson. He claims that by 2050, the world economy can operate almost entirely using wind, solar, and hydroelectric. Unfortunately, we don't have until 2050, and I'm just going to interject, you know, that this hilarious thing about China claiming it's going to be carbon neutral by 2060, and we don't have until 2050. World oil, coal, and natural gas supplies look likely to decline in the 2020 to 2025 time frame because of low prices. I don't know if Gail was saying when, every, when the rest of the pack was, was making this call about the decline of oil and gas and coal because of high prices. Now it's because of low prices. 
Another problem with this approach is that there is not very much fossil fuel to extract because most of what appears to be available from resource studies cannot really be extracted at the low prices set by physics. Uh, can you say subsidies and all that? Okay. The underlying problem is confusion about which direction prices go as an economy reaches its limits. Economists assume that scarcity will cause prices to rise. <clears throat> the real story is that fossil fuel prices are set by the laws of physics because the economy is a dissipative structure. As the economy approaches limits, prices tend to fall too low for producers rather than rise too high for consumers. The sad truth is that we cannot even count on the continued extraction of the small amount of fossil fuels that Jacobson so assumes will exist after 2050. Okay, what else? That, let's look at the financial system. What is Gale's outlook for the global financial system? <clears throat> We are likely to see a huge change in the international financial system and in the international trade system in the next few years. As long as there were plenty of resources relative to the world population, the optimal approach was to do as much international trade as possible. This approach would maximize world GDP. It would also add jobs in developing areas of the world without too huge an impact on job availability in the countries moving their manufacturing to lower cost areas. In the last few years, it has become increasingly evident that there are not enough jobs that pay well to go around. This is really the underlying problem with respect to the increased hostility among nations such as between the U.S. and China. Tariffs are being used to try to bring jobs that pay well back to those who need them. Strange as it may seem, it takes fossil fuels to create jobs that pay well. <coughs> Do you think so, Gail? <coughs> Figure 7 shows that international trade was rising as a percentage of GDP for many years, and it hit a high point in 2008. Since then, it has bounced around a little below that high point, in 2020, it will take a big step down because all of the cancellation of trade related to corona panic restrictions. Yes. Uh, then, of course, my computer Okay, thank you, computer, for coming back. We saw earlier that commodity prices tend to fall too low for producers. Indirectly, this means that profits tend to fall too low. Interest rates tend to follow these low profits down since businesses cannot afford to pay high interest rates. With these low profits and low wages, the financial system gets strained. Debt and more debt seems to be the way to fix the system. Growing debt at ever lower interest rates is encouraged. These low interest rates 
tend to raise asset prices because monthly payments to buy these assets fall with the falling interest rates. Stock markets tend to rise even when the economy is doing poorly. If the many strange approaches I outlined in Section A, which I, you have to go on the link to read Section A, if the many strange approaches I outlined in Section A are used to add even more debt to keep the system afloat, eventually some part of the system is going to break. For example, banks will stop issuing letters of credit with respect to purchases made by buyers that don't seem sufficiently credit worthy. Banks may stop trusting other banks, especially if the banks do not really seem to be solvent. At some point, the international financial system seems likely to start coming apart. Eventually, the U.S. dollar will stop being the world's reserve currency. Now, I have been down this rabbit hole myself, guys, for 12 years. Over 12 years, I have been hearing all of these uh, doomsayers repeating the mantra, uh, and, and, and now I'm glad to see that Gail Tverberg at least is not putting a date on it. Uh, how many people have uh, had egg on their faces by putting a date on, uh, on this mythical doomsday scenario? It hasn't happened yet, so I'm going to throw my uh, my weight in with Gail to Verberg, eventually, I like that, eventually the U.S. dollar will stop being the reserve, <clears throat> the world's reserve currency. My guess is that a new two-currency system will develop. Governments <clears throat> will issue a lot of currency for local use. It will not be useful for buying goods from other countries. Much of it will be used for buying locally produced food and other locally produced goods. <clears throat> Very little international trade will be done. Any international trade will occur between trusted partners at agreed upon exchange rates, perhaps a special currency will be used for this purpose. In this new world, individual countries will be very much on their own. With very little fossil fuels, countries will tend to lose electricity availability very quickly transmission lines will go unrepaired. It will become impossible to fix existing wind turbines. Road repair will become impossible. Electric cars will be as unusable as gasoline-powered ones. There will likely be fighting about resources that are available leading to countries subdividing into smaller and smaller units hoarding what little resources they have available. So thank you, Gail Tverberg, for your <clears throat> latest reading of the tea leaves. And guys, every time I <clears throat> interview somebody or read one of their F essays, this does not mean that I personally endorse everything they say. Uh, I do not believe that governments are going to start issuing 
lo that governments are going to start issuing local currencies. There is, right here in Ithaca, New York, they have this thing called Ithaca dollars that there are going to be very, very small groups of people uh, issuing local currencies. It's not going to be top down. It's going to be bottoms up. But uh, as I, th I think uh, Austin, Texas has one of these. When I lived in Santa Cruz, California back in the 80s, uh, a tiny, tiny few, but probably growing number of people are going to start, uh, you know, depending more and more on local uh, resources and currency and whatnot. But who am I to uh, debate Gail to Verberg, but I appreciate Gail uh, being such a trooper and trying to educate us and furthering this debate. So if you uh, want to show some love for Gail to Verberg, please give her your thumbs up. And while you're over here, subscribe. You need to get that bug. Subscribe to Collapse Chronicles uh, for more of this doom and gloom. Would you get that bug like that? Get the bug. Get that bug like that. Uh, and anyone who wants to support the work that I do bringing you this doom and gloom, the little dog and I greatly support, greatly appreciate the support. And with that, I need to wrap this up because we have a big pile of uh, manure uh, out on the side of the road and we have to start spreading manure because it's going to be time to plant our clover on October 1st. Get out there and spread your manure while you still can. Bye, guys. Did you get that bug or not? Get the bug. That bug. Where's that bug? It's probably from that pile of manure out there. Bye, guys. Where's the bug?